part second of part two of Trilby. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Trilby by Georges Dumouriez, part second, part two. In a few minutes more, he asked the laird if he knew German. Just enough to understand, said the laird, who had spent a year in Dusseldorf, and Svengali said to him in German, See, she sleeps not, but she shall not open her eyes. Ask her. Are you asleep, Miss Trilby? asked the laird. No. Then open your eyes and look at me. She strained to open her eyes, but could not, and said so. Then Svengali said again in German, She shall not open her mouth. Ask her. Why couldn't you open your eyes, Miss Trilby? She strained to open her mouth and speak, but in vain. She shall not rise from the divan, ask her. But Trilby was spellbound and could not move. I will now set her free, said Svengali. And lo, she got up and waved her arms and cried, Vive la Prusse, me voilà guéri. And in her gratitude she kissed Svengali's hand, and he leered and showed his big brown teeth and the yellow whites at the top of his big black eyes, and drew his breath with a hiss. Now I'll go to Durian's and sit. How can I thank you, monsieur? You have taken all my pain away. Yes, mademoiselle, I have got it myself. It is in my elbows. But I love it, because it comes from you. Every time you have pain, you shall come to me. Twelve rue Tirliard, au sixième, au-dessus de Pontresol. And I will cure you and take your pain myself. Oh, you are too good. And in her high spirits, she turned round on her heel and uttered her portentous war cry, Milk below! The very rafters rang with it, and the piano gave out a solemn response. What is that you say, mademoiselle? Oh, it's what the milkmen say in England. It is a wonderful cry, mademoiselle, wunderschön. It comes straight through the heart. It has its roots in the stomach and blossoms into music on the lips like the voice of Madame Alboni. Voce sulle labbre. It is good production, c'est un cri du coeur. It will be blushed with pride and pleasure. Yes, mademoiselle, I know only one person in the whole world who can produce the voice so well as you. I give you my word of honour. Who is it, monsieur? Yourself? Ach, no, mademoiselle, I have not that privilege. I have unfortunately no voice to produce. It is a waiter at the Café de la Rotonde in the Palais Royal. When you call for coffee, he says, boom, in basso profondo. Tiefstimme, F moll, below the line. It is phenomenal. It is like a cannon. A cannon also has very good production, mademoiselle. They pay him for it a thousand francs a year because he brings many customers to the Café de la Rotonde, where the coffee isn't very good, although it costs three sous a cup dearer than at the Café La Souille in the Rue Flambert Jovon. When he dies, they will search all France for another, and then all Germany, where the good waiters come from, and the cannons, but they will not find him, and the Café de la Rotonde will be bankrupt, unless you will consent to take his place. Will you permit that I shall look into your mouth, mademoiselle? She opened her mouth wide, and he looked into it. Himmel! The roof of your mouth is like the dome of the Pantheon. There is room in it for toutes les gloires de la France, and a little to spare. The entrance to your throat is like the middle porch of Saint-Sulpice, when the doors are open for the faithful on All Saints' Day. And not one tooth is missing. Thirty-two British teeth as white as milk, and as big as knuckle-bones. And your little tongue is scooped out like the leaf of a pink peony. And the bridge of your nose is like the belly of a Stradivarius. What a sounding board! And inside your beautiful big chest the lungs are made of leather. And your breath it embalms, like the breath of a beautiful white heifer fed on the buttercups and daisies of the Fartalite. And you have a quick, soft, susceptible heart and a heart of gold, mademoiselle. All that sees itself in your face. Votre cœur est un lutte suspendu, aussitôt qu'on le touche, il résonne. What a pity you have not also the musical organization. Oh, but I have, monsieur. You heard me sing Ben Bolt, didn't you? What makes you say that? Svengali was confused for a moment. Then he said, When I play the Rosemonde of Schubert, mademoiselle, you look the other way and smoke a cigarette. 
You look at the big taffy, at the little billy, at the pictures on the walls, or out of window, at the sky, the chimney pots of Notre Dame de Paris. You do not look at Svengali. Svengali, who looks at you with all his eyes and plays you the Rosemonde of Schubert. Oh, my eye! exclaimed Trilby. You do use lovely language. But never mind, mademoiselle, when your pain arrives, then shall you come once more to Svengali, and he shall take it away from you, and keep it himself, for a souvenir of you, when you are gone. And when you have it no more, he shall play you the Rosemonde of Schubert, all alone for you. And then, messieurs les étudiants, montez à la chaumière, because it is gayer. And you shall see nothing, hear nothing, think of nothing but Svengali, Svengali, Svengali. Here he felt his peroration to be so happy and effective that he thought it well to go at once and make a good exit. So he bent over Trilby's shapely freckled hand and kissed it, and bowed himself out of the room without even borrowing his five-franc piece. He's a rum on, ain't he? said Trilby. He reminds me of a big hungry spider and makes me feel like a fly. But he's cured my pain. He's cured my pain. Ah, you don't know what my pain is when it comes. I wouldn't have much to do with him all the same, said the laird. I'd sooner have any pain than have it cured in that unnatural way. And by such a man as that. He's a bad fellow, Svengali, I'm sure of it. He mesmerized you. That's what it is. Mesmerism. I've often heard of it, but never seen it done before. They get you into their power and just make you do any blessed thing they please. Lie, murder, steal, anything. And kill yourself into the bargain when they've done with you. It's just too terrible to think of. So spake the laird earnestly, solemnly, surprised out of his usual self, and most painfully impressed. And his own impressiveness grew upon him and impressed him still more. He loomed quite prophetic. Cold shivers went down Trilby's back as she listened. She had a singularly impressionable nature, as was shown by her quick and ready susceptibility to Svengali's hypnotic influence. And all that day, as she posed for Durian, to whom she did not mention her adventure, she was haunted by the memory of Svengali's big eyes and the touch of his soft, dirty fingertips on her face, and her fear and her repulsion grew together. And Svengali, Svengali, Svengali went ringing in her head and ears till it became an obsession, a dirge, a knell, an unendurable burden, almost as hard to bear as the pain in her eyes. Svengali, Svengali, Svengali. At last she asked Durian if he knew him. Parbleu, si je connais Svengali. Qu'est-ce que t'en penses? Quand il sera mort, ça fera une fameuse crapule de moins. Chez Carrel. Carrel's atelier or painting school was in the rue Notre Dame des Potirons Saint Michel, at the end of a large courtyard, where there were many large dirty windows facing north, and each window let the light of heaven into a large dirty studio. The largest of these studios, and the dirtiest, was Carrel's, where some thirty or forty art students drew and painted from the nude model every day but Sunday from eight till twelve, and for two hours in the afternoon, except on Saturdays, when the afternoon was devoted to much-needed orgian sweepings and cleanings. One week the model was male, the next female, and so on, alternating through the year. A stove, a model throne, stools, boxes, some fifty strongly built low chairs with backs, a couple of score easels, and many drawing boards completed the mobilier. The bare walls were adorned with endless caricatures, des charges, in charcoal and white chalk, and also the scrapings of many palettes, polychromous decoration not unpleasing. For the freedom of the studio and the use of the model, each student paid ten francs a month to the massier, or senior student, the responsible bellwether of the flock. Besides this, it was expected of you, on your entrance or initiation, that you should pay for your footing, your bienvenue, some thirty, forty or fifty francs, to be spent on cakes and rum punch all round. Every Friday, Monsieur Carrel, a great artist, and also a stately, well-dressed and most courteous gentleman, duly decorated with the red rosette of the Legion of Honour, came for two or three hours, and went the round, spending a few minutes at each drawing board or easel, ten or even twelve when the pupil was an industrious and promising one. 
He did this for love, not money, and deserved all the reverence with which he inspired this somewhat irreverent and most unruly company, which was made up of all sorts. Greybeards, who had been drawing and painting there for thirty years or more, and remembered other masters than Carrel, and who could draw and paint a torso almost as well as Titian or Velasquez, almost but not quite, and who could never do anything else, and were fixtures at Carrel's for life. Younger men, who in a year or two, or three or five, or ten or twenty, were bound to make their mark, and perhaps follow in the footsteps of the master, others as conspicuously singled out for failure and future mischance, for the hospital, the garret, the river, the morgue, or worse, the traveller's bag, the road, or even the paternal counter. Irresponsible boys, mere rapins, all laugh and chaff and mischief, blague et bagu parisien, little lords of misrule, wits, butts, bullies, the idle and industrious apprentice, the good and the bad, the clean and the dirty, especially the latter, all more or less animated by a certain esprit de corps, and working very happily and genially together, on the whole, and always willing to help each other with sincere artistic counsel, if it was asked for seriously, though it was not always couched in terms very flattering to one's self-love. Before little Billy became one of this band of brothers, he had been working for three or four years in a London art school, drawing and painting from the life. He had also worked from the antique in the British Museum, so that he was no novice. As he made his debut at Carrel's one Monday morning, he felt somewhat shy and ill at ease. He had studied French most earnestly at home in England, and could read it pretty well, and even write it and speak it after a fashion, but he spoke it with much difficulty, and found studio French a different language altogether from the formal and polite language he had been at such pains to acquire. Ollendorf does not cater for the Quartier Latin. Acting on Taffy's advice, for Taffy had worked under Carrel, little Billy handed sixty francs to the Massier for his bienvenue, a lordly sum, and this liberality made a most favourable impression, and went far to destroy any little prejudice that might have been caused by the daintiness of his dress, the cleanliness of his person, and the politeness of his manners. A place was assigned to him, and an easel, and a board, for he elected to stand at his work and begin with a chalk drawing. The model, a male, was posed, and work began in silence. Monday mornings is always rather sulky everywhere, except perhaps in duty. During the ten minutes' rest, three or four students came and looked at little Billy's beginnings, and saw at a glance that he thoroughly well knew what he was about, and respected him for it. Nature had given him a singularly light hand, or rather two, for he was ambidextrous, and could use both with equal skill, and a few months' practice at a London life school had quite cured him of that purposeless indecision of touch, which often characterises the apprentice hand for years of apprenticeship, and remains with the amateur for life. The lightest and most careless of his pencil strokes had a precision that was inimitable, and a charm that specially belonged to him, and was easy to recognise at a glance. His touch on either canvas or paper was like Svengali's on the keyboard, unique. As the morning ripened, little attempts at conversation were made, little breakings of the ice of silence. It was Lambert, a youth with a singularly facetious face, who first woke the stillness with the following uncalled-for remarks in English very badly pronounced. Have you seen my father's old shoes? I have not seen your father's old shoes. Then, after a pause, have you seen my father's old hat? I have not seen your father's old hat. Presently another said, Je trouve qu'il a une jolie tête, l'anglais. But I will put it all into English. I find that he has a pretty head, the Englishman. What say you, Barizel? Yes, but why has he got eyes like brandy balls to a penny? Because he's an Englishman. Yes, but why has he got a mouth like a guinea pig, with two big teeth in front, like the double blank at Domino's? Because he's an Englishman. Yes, but why has he got a back without any bend in it, as if he'd swallowed the Cologne Vendôme as far up as the Battle of Austerlitz? Because he's an Englishman. And so on, till all the supposed characteristics of little Billy's outer man were exhausted. Then, Babelard, what? 
I should like to know if the Englishman says his prayers before going to bed. Ask him. Ask him yourself. I should like to know if the Englishman has sisters, <laughs> and if so, how old and how many and what sex. Ask him. Ask him yourself. I should like to know the detailed and circumstantial history of the Englishman's first love and how he lost his innocence. Ask him, etc., etc., etc. Little Billy, conscious that he was the subject of conversation, grew somewhat nervous. Soon he was addressed directly. Dis donc, l'anglais. Quoi? said little Billy. Avez-vous une sœur? Oui. Est-ce qu'elle vous ressemble? Non. C'est bien dommage. Est-ce qu'elle dit ses prières le soir en se couchant? A fierce look came into little Billy's eyes, and a redness to his cheeks, and this particular form of overture to friendship was abandoned. Presently Lambert said, Si nous mettions l'anglais à l'échelle, little Billy, who had been warned, knew what this ordeal meant. They tied you to a ladder and carried you in procession up and down the courtyard, and if you were nasty about it, they put you under the pump. During the next rest, it was explained to him that he must submit to this indignity, and the ladder, which was used for reaching the high shelves round the studio, was got ready. Little Billy smiled a singularly winning smile, and suffered himself to be bound with such good humour that they voted it wasn't amusing, and unbound him, and he escaped the ordeal by ladder. Taffy had also escaped, but in another way. When they tried to seize him, he took up the first rapin that came to hand, and using him as a kind of club, he swung him about so freely and knocked down so many students and easels and drawing boards with him, and made such a terrific rumpus that the whole studio had to cry for packs. Then he performed feats of strength, of such a surprising kind, that the memory of him remained in Carrel's studio for years, and he became a legend, a tradition, a myth. It is now said, in what still remains of the Quartier Latin, that he was seven feet high, and used to juggle with the massier and model as with a pair of billiard balls, using only his left hand. To return to little Billy. When it struck twelve, the cakes and rum punch arrived, a very goodly sight that put everyone in a good temper. The cakes were of three kinds, babas, madeleines, and savarin. Three sous apiece, four pence half penny, the set of three. No nicer cakes are made in France, and they are as good in the Quartier Latin as anywhere else. No nicer cakes are made in the whole world that I know of. You must begin with the Madeleine, which is rich and rather heavy, then the Baba, and finish up with the Savarin, which is shaped like a ring, very light and flavoured with rum, and then you must really leave off. The rum punch was tepid, very sweet, and not a bit too strong. They dragged the model thrown into the middle, and a chair was put on for little Billy, who dispensed his hospitality in a very polite and attractive manner, helping the massier first, and then the other greybeards in the order of their greyness, and so on, down to the model. Presently, just as he was about to help himself, he was asked to sing them an English song. After a little pressing, he sang them a song about a gay cavalier who went to serenade his mistress and a ladder of ropes and a pair of masculine gloves that didn't belong to the gay cavalier, but which he found in his lady's bower. A poor sort of song, but it was the nearest approach to a comic song he knew. There are four verses to it, and each verse is rather long. It does not sound at all funny to a French audience, and even with an English one, Little Billy was not good at comic songs. He was, however, much applauded at the end of each verse. When he had finished, he was asked if he were quite sure there wasn't any more of it, and they expressed a deep regret, and then each student straddling on his little thick-set chair as on a horse, and clasping the back of it in both hands, galloped round little Billy's throne quite seriously, the strangest procession he had ever seen. It made him laugh till he cried, so that he could not eat or drink. End of Part 2 Part 2 Recording by Estelle Jobson, Rome, Italy.